Gracious and mighty God, we praise and thank you for your word. We thank you for your written word given to us in our scriptures that we may know your laws and your commandments, and your grace and your mercy and your deliverance of your people throughout the ages. We praise and thank you, Lord, for the living word, for the word made flesh, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to open the scriptures to us and to show us through word and deed, through his life, death, and resurrection, what it truly means to live in the kingdom of God, loving God and neighbor. We ask your blessing upon us this morning as we read and hear and speak your written word. Through it, may we be challenged and strengthened to hear and know and follow the living word, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture this morning comes to us from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, found on page 819 of your pew Bible. Listen to the word of God. Starting at chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. And again, if you will turn to page 804 of your Pew Bible, our second scripture comes from the 15th chapter of John, beginning with verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first scripture that we read from Acts tells the very, very end of another one of my favorite stories in Acts. It is the story of Peter and Cornelius. Peter, a disciple of Jesus, is sent to Cornelius, not a Jew, but someone who was curious about Jesus. And Peter not only was sent to preach to him, Peter was sent to eat with him. Now, we are a potluck loving denomination. That doesn't seem so odd to us. We are called to, Peter was called to eat with Cornelius. What's the big deal? However, Peter was a Jew. Cornelius was not. And from the very beginning of the Hebrew people as a nation, 
in the laws that Moses was given to give to the people were dietary laws. God's people were not to eat certain things. They weren't even to plant two kinds of grain or crop in one place. They weren't even to wear clothes made of more than one fabric. And they certainly were not to intermarry with other people who were not Jews. But they weren't even allowed to eat with them. And then Jesus came. And Jesus did a lot of things that the laws of Moses seemed to say do not do. He touched lepers. He forgave sins. He rose from the grave. <laughs> and as it turns out, as we've talked about time and time again, Jesus was fulfilling the law. He wasn't overturning it. He was coming to show them what the law really meant and how it was to be interpreted. And so after Christ's resurrection, after his ascension, as the disciples begin to preach to all the known world as they have been commanded to do, and this is after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit has, has come on everyone in that room. As they begin to preach, the disciples discover even more things about the fulfillment of the law, which at its heart, at its foundation, teaches us how to live in relationship with God and with one another. So here's Peter. He's been told to go preach at Cornelius's and stay for lunch. He's wondering what to do about this, and he has a dream. He falls asleep, and he has a dream. And in this dream, picnic blanket is let down. And on it are all sorts of foods. Foods that are clean and foods that are unclean. And Peter's commanded to go and eat. Now here's the thing. If you are obeying the dietary laws as they were understood, you couldn't even eat food that was on the same table as unclean food. If any of you are uh, have friends or relatives or know um, any uh, conservative Orthodox Jewish families, they have two refrigerators. Because not only do they have foods they're not allowed to eat, which don't ever even come into the house, but they have foods that aren't even allowed to touch each other. And so Peter is called to eat clean food off of this picnic blanket on which are many unclean foods. And more than that, he's commanded to eat everything on them. Taste everything. And in his dream, Peter says, no, 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 Lord, I, unclean food has never, ever touched my lips. And the Lord says, and yet I tell you, go and eat. And that same thing, that same dream sequence happens a second and a third time. And through that, through that amazing act, that amazing dream, God is saying, it's not the food, y'all. It's not the food. This is the wrong page. All foods are clean because all people are clean. Because all people are.
our mind. All foods are clean because all people are clean. Because, God says, all people are mine. So, what happens next, the very end of the story, as Peter has preached to them the gospel, eaten with them, then being Cornelius and his household, then Peter says, would you like to be baptized? And the Jews who have gone with him and accompanied Peter on this mission are Amazed. They're amazed that Cornelius and his household wish to be baptized. They're amazed that Peter would consent to this. They are amazed at the signs that the Holy Spirit has come upon all of those present. They thought the Holy Spirit was only for God's people. That is only for the Jews. And yet, the Spirit of God, the gifts of God, the fruit of God's Spirit is for Gentiles too. Why is that good news? I'll start with the less obvious, perhaps. <clears throat> of course it's good news because it means that everyone is open to preaching, to teaching, to the Spirit. We are to go out into all the world and preach and teach and baptize and be brothers and sisters and love, love one another. But you know, it's really, 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 really good news <clears throat> because, well, let's see, I've been in this business almost 19 years and I've spent all those 19 years as a Gentile preaching Gentiles. Friends, the story of Peter preaching to Cornelius' household, the story of the Holy Spirit coming upon the members of that household, the story of them seeking baptism is our story. It's our story. We are the ones who are adopted grafted into God's family. We are the ones that Peter's companions are shocked at. We are the ones whose tables the people of God were afraid to come and eat at. We are the Gentiles. I think, how many of you um, are Jewish? Or ever have been. My friends, we're the Gentiles. This is the heart of the good news of this passage for us. That no food is unclean because no person is unclean. Because God is the God of all people. Even, hope I don't get in trouble, even those who don't know him. If you don't know God, God still created you. God is still ruler and lord of the planet on which. 
don't you live, whether you know God or not. And so all people, all people are our fields that we are commanded to harvest. All the world. That's what Christ said. Go into all the world and baptize and teach and make disciples. That was his last message. We know it in the, the, the Great Commission. We know it in the last words of Christ spoken to his disciples before he ascends. God went to all the world. And man, the world's gotten bigger since then. Chapters 15 through about 17 of John are among my absolute favorite scriptures. And of course, chapter 15, and all of that is part of Jesus' last speech, if you will, last sayings, last words to his disciples before he is crucified and resurrected. Chapter 15 is where we find love one another. A new commandment that we've learned really isn't so new after all. Love one another. If you do this, you are my children. And if you do this as my children, then the next step is to go out of the world and bear fruit. Bear fruit. Bear fruit. And that, that just multiplies the good news that we heard in the story of Peter and Cornelius. Because that means that not just those twelve who were with Jesus. Not just those who are of the Jewish faith, but all of us are called to bear fruit. And we're equipped to bear fruit. We wouldn't be able to do that if that understanding of who we are as God's people had not been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. No food is unclean because no person is unclean. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him, whoever believed in him. There's no parentheses in that verse. There's no whoever believes in him as long as they're Jews. Whoever believes in him as long as they obey the food laws. Whoever believes in him as long as they don't touch anybody unclean so they can remain clean themselves. There's no parentheses in there. Whoever believes in him will not die but will have eternal life. That's the good news. It's such good news for us. It's such good news for everyone. Because that hope, the hope of the resurrection is for every one. I'm so excited and I'm so nervous because we seem to be 
successfully growing strawberries in our backyard for the very first time. I'm so excited because you can see there are two strawberries that we should be able to pick in about a week. Maybe less, I don't know. I've never done this before. And you can see the flowers on the other plant that, you know, how the, the flower kind of like goes like this and then just kind of like squirts out the fruit. It's, it's so cool. But I'm nervous. Because I hear critters like to eat strawberries. And I've I've protected them so far, and I, I think I, I can keep them protected, but I don't know. I can't wait to go out there and pick a strawberry right off the plant. I can't wait for another few weeks when my tomatoes start flowering and blooming. I get to go out and pick a tomato right off the plant. And I can do that because the branches, the stems, the leaves, they abide in the vine and therefore they produce fruit. And that's good news. Not only are we called to bear fruit, we are equipped to bear fruit, and we're invited to bear fruit by abiding in the vine. There's part of me that cannot wait for Wednesday morning. It's going to be a long drive, but... I will get back to my parents' home. It's only been their home for about a year and a half. Two years, shoot. Yeah, year and a half. But it's got the touches, you know? And I can tell it's, 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 it's my parents' home. It's my family's home. And of course, it has my mom and my dad. And I'll get to see my sister and my brother-in-law and my three-year-old nephew. Where I, that's where we long to come back to, always, isn't it? Home. The place where we abide. The place where we are safe. The place where we are at rest. And we are invited to abide in God. Abide in the vine. So that we can grow so that we can bear fruit, so that whosoever comes along and hungers for that fruit can reach out and pluck it down. And then the invitation extends to them. And they begin to abide. My dad used to say, be careful, don't eat those apple seeds, you'll get apples running out your ear, coming out your ears. But it's kind of like that. Because whoever comes by desiring that fruit, hungering that fruit, can pluck it off, taste of that fruit. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then that person begins to abide and to bear fruit. I'm growing strawberries in, in pots because I've, I've been told that you have to be really careful and, and, and diligent about pruning strawberry, or strawberries or they will take over your entire world. why I'm growing them in pots, but isn't that a wonderful image for the gifts of the Holy Spirit? For the knowledge of the grace and mercy of God? For the invitation to abide, the invitation to eternal life? Isn't that a fantastic image? 
It almost makes me want to go home and take those strawberries out of the pots and put them in the ground. Almost. Because you just get this image of fruit everywhere. Fruit bearing people everywhere who abide in the vine and who feed others. It doesn't matter who you are. So I want to charge you and I challenge you with this. I want to leave you with this. Bear fruit. Bear fruit. And be open to anyone who wants to know, who wants to taste, who wants to abide. For we are all people of God. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this challenge. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy and for the strength that you Give us the invitation that you give us to abide in you because that is where we get our strength. That is where we get our courage. That is how we bear fruit. And that is how the garden of your kingdom grows. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able to